Well, let's dig into it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining bright and early on the last day of Dev Days here in Amsterdam. Uh, I'm Josh Mandel. I'm at Microsoft. I'm the chief architect for the Microsoft Healthcare Group, but also have been working on uh, the Smart on Fire standards over a number of years and wanted to spend this morning to share with you some thoughts about how these standards can apply to a whole set of use cases in the consumer access space. So there's a link at the top here, which will take you to uh, these slides and other related decks. So please jot that down, bit.ly slash smartfiretech, if you want to follow along. And part of what I'll show this morning will be some live demonstrations, and the, the deck also links out to some other related specifications. So it's useful to be able to uh, click those links from within the deck. All right. So goals for this morning's session. Uh, I really want to build towards a better understanding of this sort of ecosystem of components that fit together when it comes to client applications and services that are getting authorized to access healthcare data. Big picture, we want to talk about an ecosystem where more apps can get access to more data under the right circumstances with explicit uh, approval. And I want to help everyone here think through the OAuth process flow itself, give you a sense of where in that process flow OAuth as a protocol has built in extensibility points. And I think there's a really good comparison here with Fire. Uh, so Fire as a platform specification gives you lots of building blocks that you can reconfigure to build different kinds of applications and tools and workflows. Uh, and similarly, OAuth has a lot of knobs and dials that you can turn. So I want to give you a sense of where some of those knobs and dials are. Um, and then at a meta level, I'll be linking out to and including pictures from a number of, of the core web specifications from IETF. And I just want to give folks a, a good familiarity for looking at those diagrams. And uh, when I first started looking at them, they could be kind of intimidating, uh, but they're really actually very straightforward once you sort of get a sense of the language used in those documents. So I want to look at this through the lens of a consumer access use case, um, both because it's something important to me and also because I think it, it gives us a good way to think about how to assemble some of these parts. Uh, and in particular, we're going to think about imaging. So throughout today, we're going to use an example of a consumer application that wants to connect not only to clinical data in a health record system, but also to medical imaging data uh, that often is stored next to or alongside the clinical data. Uh, but these same techniques could be applied to other kinds of what you might call auxiliary data stores, so things like a genomics data archive or pathology data, or even other kinds of uh, consumer data like fitness data. Um, so there's a broad context here. We'll be focused on imaging just to put a finer point on it and to, to give you some concrete examples. Uh, but generally think about data that's sitting outside of or next to the EHR. And over the course of the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to cover a lot of topics in a little bit of detail. So I'll give you a sense of some of the OAuth specifications around things like token introspection, some approaches to managing permissions or scopes in a structured way, uh, talk through some of the specifications uh, for managing uh, different kinds of client application flows, particularly for clients that are installed on a native mobile device, talk through different authentication mechanisms for those flows, and then talk a little bit about how clients get registered with an OAuth server. So it's a laundry list of topics, and I wanted to provide kind of a framework. Why are we thinking about this particular set of topics? And if these terms don't make sense yet, that's just fine. That's what we're here for. Uh, but I wanted to give people kind of a mental or, or visual map for thinking through this flow. Uh, and I started off by trying to draw like a, a simplified version of what an OAuth flow looks like. Uh, and then I realized that not only can other people not read my handwriting, but I often can't read my own handwriting. Uh, so I, I did the... Uh, the computer version. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in general, when you think about an OAuth flow, uh, there's a series of steps that need to happen. Uh, so out of band or ahead of time, usually there's some kind of app registration. That happens early on where the app gets what's called a client ID with respect to a specific OAuth server. Um, and depending on how that app is going to authenticate, it might also get a secret, things like that. They're set up out of band often and ahead of time. Then when an app goes to launch, goes to connect to a particular user's data, uh, there's a bit of a discovery process that happens. So how does the app know uh, what OAuth servers it needs to connect to, where the user is trying to go? Um, so this might look something like a provider selection screen inside of a consumer app, where you say, OK, out of the 1,000 hospitals this app knows how to connect to, which is the one I want to connect to right now? Uh, and then there's an authorization process, which we talked through a little bit in the smart overview yesterday. Uh, but this typically looks like a user uh, signing into a health record that they have control of, and then looking at a view of, of permissions or scopes and saying which permissions or which scopes they want to grant access to for this particular application. And then if they approve it, uh, they're sent back to the application. 
And at that point, the app can query for data. It has an OAuth access token. Um, those data are protected by a set of uh, authorization servers, and the data are stored in some resource servers where the app is going to make these queries to, and the app gets back data. And then at the end of this process, maybe the access token expires, and the app has some way to refresh it. So that's the basic flow, and we'll be talking about different points along this flow where we have uh, extensibility or where we can build in better capabilities. So let me just pause there and see if there's questions about the setup. OK, cool. So I mentioned we're going to think about consumer access. If I, as a consumer, want to share my imaging data with an application of my choice, and I also want to share my clinical data to give this app a broad view of my own history, uh, what are some of the requirements? So one is, as a consumer, please don't give me a new login and a new portal where I need to go in order to make this sharing decision. I probably have too many, as it stands, and I'd like to be able to use uh, the account I already have within a health system to manage permissions for that health system. Uh, so it would be nice if I could make that decision in one place, for example, within my account uh, at Partners Healthcare in Boston, and say, yes, I want to share my clinical data, and I want to share my imaging data from Partners Healthcare um, in one process, one flow. Uh, and ideally, we would hook into some of the existing infrastructure, some of the existing OAuth services that are deployed in an organization like that. Um, and again, we'll talk through the example of a picture archiving system, but think about these techniques more generally. OK, so naively, if you wanted to build support for those kinds of, uh, of desired uh, functions or those kinds of requirements, ideally, uh, you might just say, well, I've got this EHR data that already has in my database. I've got meds and labs and allergies and problems and all the clinical stuff. Simplest thing is you know, just put the images in there, too. And that's super great because there's a set of fire resources that cover uh, imaging studies, and you can search for them by name and modality and patient and date. All, all kinds of good metadata there, and you can just grab that, and it's got pointers to the underlying DICOM data, and you say, fine, I get one access token, it's got access to clinical and imaging data, and I can make my queries. So from a client perspective, actually, this is beautiful. And from an end user perspective, it works just great. You make decision in one place, app gets access to all the data it needs. Um, you know, the only problem is this is just not how the real world is set up. Um, so the deployed base of every EHR software everywhere is that those databases know how to hold meds and problems and allergies in labs, and they don't know how to hold imaging data. And in fact, those imaging data are maintained by different systems, by picture archiving systems, built by separate vendors and often supporting different technologies. Um, so even though from the client perspective this is lovely, in the real world you just can't deploy it. It doesn't scale well. Um, and asking the EHR vendors to step in and do something new for every additional data type, like imaging, genomics, pathology, and so on, uh, means that all that work is, is concentrated. We don't have a, an opportunity to separate it, those concerns out by specialty. Uh, so that's approach number one. We can sort of cross that off as uh, naively appealing, but not realistic. Another thing that we could do, which separates the concerns a little bit better, is to say, well, my client application is still just going to talk to the EHR. Uh, it just as an implementation detail under the hood, some queries the EHR will be able to answer natively. Like if I ask for meds or problems or allergies, the EHR will just respond by looking up data in its database. Um, but other kinds of data like imaging, the EHR will just sort of shell out or proxy the request to some underlying system. So I can issue a query to get imaging data. The EHR says, ah, that's a data type. I know where to find it, not in my system, but in this underlying PAC system. And these two systems know how to talk to each other. And the EHR grabs the data out and responds to the client, passing through the data uh, in real time. Uh, so the nice thing here from the client perspective is, is identical to approach number one. Uh, the client actually can't tell the difference between these two architectures. Uh, so we check all the sort of usability boxes. Um, and scaling-wise, the nice thing is EHR vendors don't need to understand how imaging data works in depth. Um, but actually doing this kind of proxying requires a fair degree of coordination between the EHR vendors and the PACs or the imaging vendors. They have to agree on exactly which APIs are going to be uh, queried or proxied uh, and what data formats are going to be used. Uh, and the EHR might need to understand enough of those return data to do things like um, updating IDs and coding systems to match some of the expectations. Uh, so we don't do great on separation of concerns. Um, what else can we do in this space? Well, the other thing that we can do is rather than having the client API connect just to the EHR, we can give the client a little more information. We can tell the client uh, a little bit more about what's happening under the hood to say, well, there's actually a couple data systems here. There's, there's multiple API server endpoints, multiple resource servers you can connect to within this organization. And if you want EHR data, you talk to this one. If you want PACS data, you talk to that one. 
We're talking now about a little bit more work on the client side to know which server to connect to, to get which kind of data. And of course, you could put a gateway in front of all this and just say, well, this, this, is, this is the only one system you need to talk to. But under the hood, I want to think about what needs to happen to allow this kind of re uh, request to go through. So now we've got a client making a call with, with one access token to either an EHR server or a PAC server. Um, and if you're following along the sort of visuals here, this weird stretchy box thing uh, is actually this lock icon stretched to be sitting in front of the EHR and the PAC system. So this is representing sort of one consistent set of authorization rules. Uh, and the nice thing here is the client gets one access token that it can use in two places, but the organization that's managing this authorization server, managing the data across these databases, uh, can have one place where they handle registration of apps, one place where they manage permissions, audit logging, token revocation, refreshes, all that sort of OAuth um, internal stuff. <coughs> And then what happens under the hood is the PACs, as a database server or as a, a fire resource server in the system, uh, when it sees a request coming from this client, it can use that access token associated with the request and figure out what that access token is supposed to be good for. It can basically um, get information about the token and use that information to decide whether to allow or to reject a particular request. So it can use that token for its own access control decisions. And we'll talk through what that looks like in a little bit more detail. That, in general, is an approach that we call token introspection. Uh, and this is, this is a way to explicitly model the relationship between what OAuth refers to as an authorization server and a resource server. So in the core OAuth spec, that is completely out of scope. What the OAuth spec says is these two servers um, just work together somehow. They, the auth server generates a token. The resource ser server knows how to understand that token. Uh, and use it to make access control decisions. But you could do this lots of different ways. One thing you could do is just give those two servers a shared database somewhere uh, of what all the tokens mean, and the auth server writes to it, and the resource server reads to it, and you actually don't need any standardization there if those two servers are provided by the same vendor and they're part of a coherent system. It's only when we start trying to provide a broader kind of interoperability. It's only when we start trying to layer on multiple resource servers that the API for looking that stuff up actually matters. So it's out of scope in the core OAuth spec because it doesn't have to do with how an app connects into the system. It's more of a system internal detail. Um, but pragmatically, it can be really useful to standardize this. So there's a very small specification called token introspection that helps solve this problem when we've got multiple resource servers. So in terms of the overall map that I showed you in the beginning, we're right here. We're at this interface between one of the resource servers and the authorization server. So just to orient you to that process flow. Um, and token introspection, this is uh, RFC 7662 from the Internet Engineering Task Force. It's a very simple API that a resource server can call. Uh, very simple. It's a HTTP API with one parameter called token, and that is a required parameter. And so the, the client here is our, our fire resource server. It's making this request of an OAuth authorization server to say, I've got this token. What is it for? What does this token do? What does it mean? And the authorization server responds with a JSON payload like this. Uh, this is just an example directly copied and pasted from the spec. Uh, so this is a property that tells you whether the token is currently active or not. That's a Boolean. It's a property that tells you what client the token is associated with, uh, and some other details like um, who issued it, when was it issued? When does it expire? So there are a number of standardized fields uh, defined in the IETF spec here, and then the opportunity to layer on any additional extensions as needed. So it's a super simple API, uh, but it's already pretty useful just in defining a few fields. And if we think about how we would use this in the context of our Fire implementation, well, it would be our PAC server. Our imaging server would be making this request to the authorization server. It would be saying, hey, um, I've got this token. Uh, that I just received because a client app is asking for access to this particular image study for this patient. The client app gave me this token. Is this token any good? So it sends this request over to the authorization server. It says, what is this token good for? Uh, and it gets a response which maybe looks like this. this. The authorization server would say, yep, it's an active token. These are the scopes associated with it. So patient slash star dot read. Here's maybe the, the patient associated with this token since it's scoped to one patient's record. Here's how you know which patient's record to allow this read access to. So the authorization server would respond with these kinds of details uh, that the imaging server can use. And functionally, what does the imaging server really need to do here? Well, it needs to figure out if this token is currently good, because uh, it, if it's not good, then we can just reject the request right away. 
Uh, if the token is good, well, is it good for imaging studies? Is it good for this particular API call that the client has made? So you need to know something about what scopes have been requested. Uh, in particular, you want to know whether the imaging study dot read scope uh, is permitted by this token. Uh, and then critically, when we're talking about consumer access, we need to know which consumer and which patient record have they authorized access to. Uh, and here there's sort of an interesting subproblem because many different uh, information systems within a hospital or within a health system manage patients differently. They've got their own patient lists and identifiers. Uh, and in Fire, we really want to get down to the level of patient dot ID, uh, because that's how references are made between resources. So the way that I know which patient compartment a given observation belongs to, or which patient compartment an imaging study belongs to, the way I know is by patient dot ID. So there's an opportunity here to provide a little bit more information that the imaging server can use to make its decisions. So rather than just passing along, you know, one record number or one ID, the authorization server can pass along a full fire patient resource, which could have a list of identifiers, and hopefully the PACS recognizes at least one of the identifiers um, in that list based on its system and its value. Um, so we're not trying to solve an identity matching problem here, but we're trying to give a fire resource server enough information to solve that problem for itself. Uh, and inside of a lot of hospitals, there's a deep investment in a master patient index and trying to reconcile and map and make sure that patients aren't duplicated. Um, and our goal would just be to take advantage of that work that, that already exists rather than trying to define a new approach uh, to matching in this context. And so based on this data, the authorization server provides to the imaging server. The imaging server can decide whether to allow or to deny this request that came through to fetch all imaging study resources for patient one, two, three. Um, and that's the basics of token introspection. Yeah, question, please. Ah, so the question is, does every OAuth server support this? And the answer is no. I would say that very few OAuth servers support this today. So this is not, for example, part of something we define in the Smart on Fire specification. Um, part of what I'm trying to socialize with the community here is why this would be a valuable thing. And so this kind of uh, approach is something that we're looking at in the Argonaut project to, to decide, is this something we want to take on in 2020 as an effort to try to drive more standardization around these ideas in healthcare? So it's a great question. What I'm showing you right now is defined by the OAuth spec, but it's not, uh, sorry, it's defined adjacent to the OAuth spec. It's not a core concern of OAuth, but it's a useful thing when you're starting to build out broader ecosystems. Other questions at this level on token introspection? Yeah. Uh, so for the patient, you say that indeed the interfax system, so to say, has its own patient IDs, and the uh, ESR might have overlapping, but it could differ. So how do you make sure that when you request access for a certain patient, it's actually recognized by the PACS? Maybe you explained already, but I didn't catch it. No, OK. So the question is really about ID matching. What if the PACS has its own set of patient IDs? Uh, how do we manage that? Uh, so from the client perspective, we try to pr pretend as though the world looks consistent and as though resource references in Fire are all based on a consistent set of patient dot ID values. So this query the client is making is using a Fire patient ID 123, uh, and we want to make that work for the client. Under the hood, in order to make that work, the imaging server might be using different IDs. It needs more information from the authorization server to know, oh, the, the patient that I know by identifier XYZ is the patient that the EHR knows by identifier ABC, and all of those patients, we're gonna say, have patient ID 123. So in Fire, every resource can have an, must have an ID, and then generally these resources also have a list of identifiers, uh, which are these sort of business identifiers, medical record numbers or accession numbers, those kinds of things. So the goal here is from the client perspective, make the IDs work, and in order to make it work, we pass through a list of all the identifiers we know so that these systems can, can match them up as best as possible. Another question, yeah. Presumably another way of doing this is to use the sign data read here for token and uh, token rather than doing the introspection. Yes, yeah, so the question is, wouldn't another way, there are other ways to do this. So in particular, rather than defining this web API where the resource server looks up information by posting a token to the authorization server, you could use um, another approach. You could use a structured access token uh, with something like a JSON web token that's been signed by the authorization server and uh, that is totally true. So there, there are many ways to sort of solve this problem of getting the right information to the resource server. Some are stateful, some are stateless. There's a few trade-offs that we could talk through, but you're, you're perfectly right. Another question, yeah. I would say JWT would be clear text and we'd be sending this around. So, so the comment is, well, if we did that, JWT would be clear text, would you be sending it around? And, you, the, 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 and these tokens can be opaque. So yeah, that's an example of one of the trade-offs uh, that we talk about when we're thinking about when we want to use 
uh, a stateless approach that everyone knows how to uh, directly inspect uh, versus when we want to use this level of indirection with a token lookup API. Um, yeah, another question. So the question is, uh, are we assuming here that the Fire server is hosted in the cloud uh, or on-prem? Um, we try to be agnostic to that question. Uh, we just say the Fire server is hosted somewhere on the internet that is accessible to the client. Um, and beyond that, hopefully we don't care. Because you're passing the query to the identifier to the cloud. Uh, so the question is, we're passing a query with an identifier to the cloud. Um, uh, hopefully this architecture doesn't assume that a cloud exists. Uh, I think that's, that's the clearest way I can say it. Uh, a healthcare organization is responsible for putting a server online and telling clients where that server lives, so where to find it. And that could be hosted in the cloud, it could be hosted in a healthcare data system, you know, specific data center. We, we try not to have too much of a perspective on that question. But it, it, is, that, is that fair? So I think the, the question is uh, sort of who's responsible for managing protected health information in this kind of data flow. Um, and the way that I would answer it at that level is we're talking about identified data here, we're talking about healthcare data here, and we're talking about services that a healthcare provider organization is ultimately offering for a consumer app to come in and connect. So yes, all considerations about correct management of protected health information apply here. These are systems that are hosting real world protected health information every day and they need to do it right. That's, that's absolutely correct. Other questions on the token introspection? All right, let me talk a little bit then of uh, transition and talk about permissions themselves, the sort of scope models. Um, so in the intro to SMART, we talked about scopes a little bit in terms of fire, but let me back up for a moment and just look at scopes in the OAuth spec. So the core OAuth specification says that scopes are strings. Uh, and when a client is requesting a set of scopes, it is passing along a scope parameter, which is a list of space-separated strings, uh, the things that it wants to learn about. And so in SMART, we take this very simple approach and we say, well, we're going to define a language of scopes um, that are effectively just resource type and HTTP method. So uh, something like imaging study dot read uh, would be an example of how we combine those things. Uh, and for every fire resource, you could, you could change imaging study to any resource you like, or you could put a wildcard, you could put a star here. And that's basically the language of scopes that we define in SMART. Uh, and if we're talking about scopes that grant you access to resources in a particular patient compartment, then we say patient slash. So that's how we say we're not look, looking for access to all imaging studies on this server, but just the ones that belong to a specific patient compartment. Um, it's worth noting when we define a scope like this, patient slash imaging study dot read, we don't say which patient. We assume that decision is happening out of band. What we convey to the app is you got access to all the imaging studies for the current patient, and then separately we have a different parameter where we talk about which patient that is. Uh, so the nice thing there is that this scope is a, a sort of a static value. It's a constant that is always referring to the current patient in context, and the context itself is defined elsewhere. But in OAuth, uh, scopes are just strings separated by spaces, and this is super flexible. Um, and you could do almost anything with this. So if you're Facebook, you just sit down and figure out what are the Facebook APIs, what are the permissions that matter, and you define 200 scopes that cover the surface area of your API. Uh, and if you're uh, GitHub or Twitter, you, know, you take a similar kind of approach here to defining your own scopes inside of your own system. It's very flexible. All the client needs to be able to do is pass along a list of scopes at once. Um, this gets much more challenging if you're trying to scale this beyond one server that's entirely responsible for its own ecosystem. If you want different servers written by different uh, vendors to support the same standards, then we need to actually negotiate about what our list of scopes is. Uh, and we have to communicate those things precisely uh, so that they can be shown to end users, so people can authorize them, and so servers can have consistent behaviors. Um, and so one concept, one idea here is rather than trying to define a whole bunch of discrete scopes like patient observation read, imaging study read, allergy read, and letting clients build those up sort of bit by bit independently. Um, you could try to combine those in various ways. Basically create a, sort of a little document that is a, a manifest of all the data you want access to and pass that along to the server and say, this document here, this describes what I'm really looking for. Uh, that's, that's what's called often structured scopes. And in the deck, I've got a link to a really nice overview about different approaches that are taken to sort of build these structures up. And I'll, I'll show you an example in a moment. Um, 
Before I do show you that example, just keep in mind a couple things. So one is the size of these strings. So they can get very large. Um, and the other is sensitivity. So what information is getting packed into these structures? Uh, and especially since these are sent before we've established um, access, you know, who, who could see them as they go over the wire? And then we also want to think a little bit about the complexity of explaining these things to a user. Uh, so one approach, so one, one thing that folks have tried to do to standardize this is to say, well, scopes are just any string, but let's allow a resource server to sort of register them with an authorization server in a loosely coupled way. So we'll just define an API where every scope that possibly exists, we'll give it a name, uh, and we'll give it an icon URL, and a server that wants to display a screen for a patient can say, okay, here's the scopes that an app is requesting. And it doesn't really need to know any more about them beyond what name to print on the page and what icon to show. So a server can just generically get a list of scopes and render them as a bunch of checkboxes for the user. And every checkbox says, do you want to grant this permission or not? Here's what it's called, and here's an icon for it. Um, and for really simple scopes, uh, this kind of checkbox model can work well. User gets a list of those boxes, decides which permissions they want to share, um, and then moves along, hits the Approve button. And those kinds of computable def definitions, though, are, can be really challenging. So what happens in a case like Fire is, well, do we want to provide 25 checkboxes, one per Fire resource type? Um, who's responsible for explaining these definitions correctly? Do we try to standardize these ahead of time? Does, the, does each authorization server have a different kind of string to display here? This could be very challenging to get these computable definitions uh, to the level where a server can actually enforce them correctly. Uh, another design you might think about for, for scopes would be to put together this kind of a structured scope document like this, where you say, well, I'm going to define some JSON structure and say, I want to allow reading of these two kinds of resources. I want to deny, on top of that, I want to deny anything that's at a high confidentiality level. Um, so just to give you a little bit of intuition, uh, in Smart right now, the only thing you can ask for is like, read access to all observations. And that's very painful because there's no way to restrict it to just vital signs, and there's no, no way to redact or retract confidential observations, or th highly sensitive observations. So if you wanted to fix that problem, you might say, well, we're going to define this language where you pass in a, an array of conditions for what you're allowed to read, and permissions get wider if you say allow, and they get narrower if you say deny. Um, if folks have worked with like a dot git ignore file, it's the same basic model where you say what to ignore and then what, what not to ignore, and you sort of layer them in. Uh, so this is, this is one example of what that kind of system can look like, where you say, I want to allow access to all observations in the laboratory category, but then I, I, on top of that, I want to deny access to anything that is sort of uh, a, at a restricted level of uh, confidentiality or higher. Uh, and the nice thing about this is you could imagine this would be something computable. You could imagine this might be a kind of policy that an authorization server could enforce based on its knowledge of what's happening inside a set of fire resources. But there are some real challenges to working with um, scopes like this. So one is, I, I told you that scopes uh, are just strings without spaces, and this string has spaces in it, so it's invalid. Uh, it's, it's not really a, a valid scope list. Well, we can solve that problem if we just JSON stringify it uh, and turn it into a giant string. Okay, so that's sort of a trivial problem. Uh, but then beyond that, we have some, some issues. So one is usability. How do you take a string like this and render it for an end user, for a consumer, in a way that they're going to understand. So they know exactly what the app is asking for, what it's going to get, and what it's not going to get. Obviously, you can't show them this JSON string. Uh, but the general problem of explaining this properly, when especially if these query could include sort of arbitrary parameters in them um, and different systems of matching confidentiality codes, taking an arbitrary scope like this and explaining it to a consumer in a meaningful way might turn out to be an insurmountable challenge. So there's this kind of a balancing act here between what we specify ahead of time and how easily and how consistently we can explain the meaning of these scopes to the end user who's going to be either allowing or denying. Yeah. So, so the question is moving in this direction. Is there, is there a plan to standardize you know, s something along this spectrum that would be richer and better than the set of scopes that we've got today and smart? And so the answer there is yes. The work is super 
early, uh, we started laying out sort of a set of desired properties for those kinds of scopes and some of the trade-offs. So right now in the um, fire build site, actually here's, here's an Easter egg that not everyone might know. So build.fire.org is where the continuous integration version of the fire spec is hosted. Uh, and if you go to slash branches, you can see all the work in progress branches. And if you go to slash IG, you can see all the community implementation guides that are being developed here. Um, so I just wanted to show you briefly, inside of the HL7 org, there is work in progress for sort of a next version of scopes in the smart app launch framework. Um, this is a totally rough page right now, but it lays out um, sort of our current thinking about different approaches to scopes. And I won't go through the details in today's session just, just for time, but I want to point it out there and say that if you join the uh, smart discussion channel on the fire chat, this is an area of active discussion and interest. I don't know how far we will go down this line towards um, richly structured scopes versus sort of simple overviews, but this is something that we do want to figure out. Other questions on scopes? Yeah. Have we thought about um, ZACML, which I don't know how to expand the acronym, but it's XACML, uh, which is a, an XA, XML language for, for policy controls. Uh, the short answer is, is no, as sort of an Argonaut group, we haven't. There are certainly vendors inside of that group who have internal components that, that use that technology. I think we haven't looked at, um, at using that as a policy layer for explaining OAuth scopes. Yeah, so there's, there's a, a, a language there that might be a good model for how to do a more readable set of scopes. Um, all right. Thinking about how to make all this work, if we imagine we've got the right scope set, and for now, actually, imagingstudy.read is good enough for our use case, for our consumer access use case. Imagingstudy.read basically conveys what we want. Uh, if we imagine we've got token introspection in place, well, now we've got this little discovery problem. How does an app actually know that there's these two different fire servers that it should be connecting to um, within a given hospital system? How does it know which server to go to for which kind of information? Um, you could put this totally out of band. You could just say, well, the app just knows because ahead of time, how did I actually learn about the fire URL for the clinical data server? Where did it learn that from? That was out of band. So we could push the imaging question out of band too and just say somehow the app learns. It has a registry, it has a static file, it created this somewhere. Um, or we could put it in band. So we could have a discovery protocol where an app that talks to a clinical server can say, hey, I know I'm getting my clinical data from you, but by the way, do you have a place I can go to to access imaging data as well? And that server could respond and say, yeah, here's the URL for, the, for my associated or my companion service that does imaging data. So if you haven't seen the dot well known specification, that's a, a super lightweight convention for doing this kind of thing, where if you know the base URL of a server, uh, there's just sort of a reserved word as a convention to say, slash dot well known slash something. Um, and so we use this already in the Smart on Fire app launch spec for a fire client to discover the OAuth uh, authorization URLs and token URLs associated with the server. So we could use something very lightweight like that to add in one more property to say, here's the imaging server to talk to. If you're talking to me for clinical data, uh, right alongside the rest of the discovery properties that we already define in the smart specification. So we could put discovery in band, we could put it out of band. Um, I think it's probably worth having a way to put it in band, even if we don't use it from the very beginning. Um, I wanted to spend just a minute and show you a very quick demo to give you a sense of the user flow that we're talking about uh, more explicitly. So this is an open source tool that we built as part of the Sync for Science project at Harvard Medical School. Um, and it's using the workflow that, that we've been discussing about connecting a client app. So this demo is a client app that's gonna connect to a fire server uh, where there's an imaging data service and a clinical data service that sit side by side. So I'm just gonna click this button to use the default servers, but you could, you could post in any uh, fire server and imaging server URLs that you wanna use here. And if I hit start demo, this is gonna begin an OAuth approval process. So just like always, it'll send me over to a patient portal to sign in. There's a demo account that's pre-filled. Um, and as an end user, I would say, yep, these are the permissions that I wanna share. I know that I'm sharing my data with the imaging demo app. Here's all the data types that I'll be sharing. Um, go ahead and approve that access. Uh, so that's the basic OAuth flow. And now the app gets an access token that it can use for a couple things. Uh, first of all, it can fetch clinical data. So in this case, we've got patient demographics, name, date of birth, uh, location, that kind of stuff. 
And under the hood, that came from an EHR data request, fire uh, patient read. And it can also fetch a list of imaging studies. And under the hood, these are coming from the imaging data server. So the app can use its same access token to make queries to these two kinds of servers in parallel. And then under the hood, each of these imaging studies has a link to a DICOM web service with the actual raw imaging data. Um, so you can download a study into the browser and, and display um, the actual image formatted data uh, directly. So that's an example of the kind of consumer experience that we want to enable. One app connects to one service, consumer makes one decision, and the app gets access to both kinds of data in one place. Um, that's sort of the, the target. So I'm going to pause here. We've got five minutes left in the, in the hour and see if there's questions or comments um, given what we've discussed so far. All right, maybe I'll say one more thing then. Um, I'm going to skip over the discussion of mobile clients, but talk a bit about client authentication. So in the Smart on Fire specification today, uh, we say there's two kinds of clients. There's uh, public clients, which have no way to keep a secret. So these might be like apps that are running inside of a user's web browser, pure HTML5 and JavaScript apps. Uh, and then we say there's confidential clients, which are clients that um, run on a secure server somewhere uh, that can keep a secret in a tamper-proof place. Uh, but the truth is there's actually a little bit more of a spectrum uh, than just that. Um, you can imagine a client that's provisioned securely on a mobile device, uh, and maybe a user can find the secret, can pry that secret out of the binary. Uh, but if that secret only exists on that one device, every device has a different secret, uh, that sort of falls somewhere in the middle of, these, of, of this spectrum between public and confidential clients. So the basic model in the OAuth core um, works great when we're talking about traditional web applications, but doesn't exactly apply, especially in, in some of the mobile use cases. Um, one of the challenges there, though, is each time an app gets registered, if it needs to authenticate, in the core OAuth spec, there's basically one method that's defined, which is client secret authentication. The app gets a client ID, it gets a client secret, and in order to prove who it is, in order to authenticate itself, it just sends that secret along. So it's a symmetrically shared secret uh, that, the, that the app needs to get for every Fire server it connects to. Uh, but in the core OAuth spec, this is actually a point of extensibility. There are many different ways you could define client authentication methods, and there are some companion specifications that define things, uh, alternate ways that a client can authenticate. Um, so one of them, which I think is worth paying a lot more attention to, uh, is instead of using a shared secret, using asymmetric keys, where a client can register its public key with a server, and then when it wants to prove its identity, sign a JSON web token using the private key associated with that thing. Uh, the really nice part about that is you can start to publish openly a list of which clients exist out there in the world and what their public keys are. And if more servers want to define support, want to register that client, want to allow that client to connect, we don't need to go and mint a new shared secret each time, which means these things can happen out of band. A server can say, well, I'm going to approve this app today. Um, and I can just send that app developer an email and tell them, you're on board now. I don't have to come up with a, a secure channel to communicate a secret or update that secret over time. Uh, so it's a very powerful step having this kind of authentication method uh, towards a broader ecosystem where more apps can easily register with more clinical data services. I won't spend the time to talk through dynamic client registration, uh, but I look at having this kind of a public key authentication system as a good step along the way to providing easier registration processes. And there are APIs that have been defined, not really widely supported, certainly not in the healthcare space, uh, but defined to allow clients to register with an OAuth server using an HTTP API call to say, you've never heard of me before, but here I am. Here's all the details about me. Uh, please give me a client ID and allow me to connect. So that's what the dynamic client registration spec does. Um, I'll pause there. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I'll be around if you want to ask questions afterwards.